and welcome to State Matters. I'm your host, Matt Miratori. As you know, the Pilgrim Nuclear Power Plant in Plymouth ceased operation on May 31, 2019, after 47 years in operation. The plant is now being decommissioned. Today, we will discuss the progress and timelines of the plant. Joining me for this discussion is the Vice Chair of the State-Appointed Nuclear Decommissioning Citizens Advisory Panel, Pine Dubois, and the Senior Manager of Government Affairs and Communications for the Holtec Company, Patrick O'Brien. Welcome both of you. Thanks, Thanks for coming. Thanks for coming. Nice Pine, let's, let's start with you. Let's, I want to go through like, a little Absolutely. bit of your backgrounds first. Let's start with you. And who is Pine? And, sorry, and, and what is Pine? Uh, what does she do in her real life? Uh, my real life, uh, as you know, is executive director of the Jones River Watershed Association, mm -hmm. which is right next door uh, in Kingston, Mass. Um, and I've been there since 1999 as executive director. That's and, probably and when we first met them. Was in '99. Then. No, I think was we, it was. I that, think it was earlier than that? that because we were. Yeah, I think yeah. it was a little earlier okay. than that. But we started the organization in 1985, mm -hmm. um, okay. which basically started around Silver Lake, um, which is the theoretic uh, headwater of the Jones River, uh, which is the longest river actually draining to Cape Cod Bay, mm -hmm. which got me involved in uh, Pilgrim. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Great. Great. And um, Patrick, so um, talk about a little bit about your background. So uh, you have some experience with the town. A little actually, bit. Yeah. I grew, yeah. I've, I've yeah. grown up in town. I've been a life, lifelong Plymouth resident. Yeah. You know, went to Plymouth Public Schools, uh, but did started my career working up on Beacon Hill with uh, with then uh, Representative Di Macedo. And that's a week for us back. Yeah, in it was back, back then. Yeah, yeah. 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 And then yeah. Uh, spent about eight years with the town in a couple different roles, including uh, special assistant to the town manager, and energy officer, and. Uh, and I went over to whole. Well, I went over to the plant when it was run by Entergy, and we were still operating back in 2015. Mm -hmm. So I spent about seven years there. The first four, four and a half, uh, really, when we were running as an operating plant, and then I transitioned over to Holtec uh, when they took over the plant in August of 2019. Yeah, great, great. So uh, what we want to discuss today is sort of where we at with decommissioning. But before we get into it, I want to talk about the uh, uh, the nuclear decommissioning citizen advisory panel and DCAP. Can you just tell folks a little bit about the, the makeup, why that was formed, and your role, and what you're, what's, what you're trying to accomplish, the goals? Uh, it was formed by the state legislature um, in, I want to say, 2016. I think it was, yeah. Um, uh, because we foresaw that, I think Entergy had already announced that it was mm -hmm. going to close. Yeah. And uh, the standard practice throughout the United States is to establish these um, decommissioning panels in order to help uh, the public stay informed about what's happening, and in our case, um, to inform the governor and the and the energy um, uh, director, director yeah. of the yeah. of, yeah. of the legislation yeah. Yeah. of the legislative administration. Yeah, administration. there you go. Yeah. And yeah. and um, so we we meet. We were meeting uh, once a month. We now meet every other month to discuss um, uh, various com aspects of decommissioning. What are, what the public concerns are what the, the agency concerns are that are within um, the, the uh, government administration that is appointed to the panel. So we have, in addition to public members, we have uh, the DEP, um, the Department of Environmental Protection, the Department of Public Health, MEMA, uh, Housing and Urban Development. Development yeah. um, you know, as, as... I think almost every secretary yeah. in the Commonwealth, about one yeah. is actually, actually part of it. Yeah. Yeah. Close. Yeah, 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 one or two. Uh, you would know yeah. better than me. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, um, but, but that group works together as an interagency work group, and mm -hmm. the AG's office has been involved because there was a memorandum of understanding right. with Holtec. So we discuss uh, aspects of decommissioning, where the progress is at, um, and generally what the concerns are. Um, you know, as as well as the town of Plymouth has appointees to the panel, mm -hmm. and. Um, you know, there is some concern about what happens next. Once Holtec is done with decommissioning, what is going to happen for th with the 1,700 mm -hmm. acres that compromise, that compose the uh, original Entergy mm -hmm. or the original Commonwealth mm -hmm. uh, Edison, right? Boston Edison. Uh, Boston Edison. Edison. Yeah, yeah. Um, and and uh, how many facility. members are on? Is it 21? There's 21 appointed 20 members, members. Okay. although we're down a few right now. Yeah, so, so, you know, people that are interested in participating on the panel should contact uh, you they in, can contact in one my case. office, yeah. <laughs> you know, contact um, either one would, of be, you. Yep. would be great, or they yep. can give me a shout out um, yep. uh, or, or um, 
Yeah, we'll be happy to help. Uh, or the Executive that. Office of Energy and Environmental yeah. Affairs. Yeah. Okay, good, good. So um, the role of Holtec, can you yeah. talk talk about who Holtec yeah. is? And, so we actually, and if uh, you could get into yeah. a little bit about the memorandum of understanding. Sure, yeah, no, that, absolutely, that absolutely. Yeah, up, yeah, no, that's great, because I think that is a key to yeah. kind of what we're doing here. Um, so Holtec is a, is a um, kind of multifaceted company that was started, actually it was 35 years ago this week, by Dr. Chris Singh. Um, they started really uh, with, with uh, uh, energy and uh, heat transfer equipment in the, the power industry is what he, what he really started in. But the, really the specialty since uh, you know, the late 80s has been uh, helping issues in the nuclear power industry. So he had started some of the racking systems that go into spent fuel pools around uh, the countries around, uh, sorry, the plants around the country. Uh, because what you have is since uh, the Waste Policy Act of 1983, you're supposed to have a national repository for spent fuel by 1998, which clearly hasn't happened. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of these pools were designed to fit X number of assemblies. Well, with no place to go, how do you keep those pools subcritical? So he developed technology that allowed that to occur. And then really what's been the focus of the company, you know, internationally, we're in six continents. Uh, we have 14 different agencies uh, that we're licensed by to do spent nuclear fuel. Uh, around the world we, is really the spent nuclear fuel storage and, and the casks, so the dry cask systems that you put together to hold the nuclear fuel. Um, that is uh, what we're the worldwide leader in. We've done over 1,500 uh, systems worldwide. And really that was where the, the, the company had been focused until Dr. Singh uh, kind of started to see, you know, where's the industry going, what's changing. You're not having a lot of new builds in, in nuclear. You're having a lot of these start to shut down. And, you know, how could he help uh, kind of the industry at that point teamed up with uh, Holtec teamed up with SNC Lavalin, uh, which is a Canadian-based engineering firm that had some experience doing uh, deconstruction in nuclear facilities. So they kind of put that team together, and they've, we've started to acquire plants around the country. So now, in addition to Pilgrim, uh, we've taken over Oyster Creek down in New Jersey, uh, just took over Indian Point this year in, uh, in Buchanan, New York, and we're looking to take over Palisades in uh, western Michigan next year. Okay. So that's really where we're focused now. And then, you know, talking a little bit, alluding to the, the uh, agreement with the Commonwealth. So Different states have different abilities when it comes to transferring a license from um, you know, an operating nuclear plant to a shutdown plant. Uh, Massachusetts uh, was somewhat unique in the sense that they didn't actually have a role, but the Attorney General, when, when the license transfer went in, said, hey, you know, we have some concerns we'd like to um, you know, put on the table. While the NRC didn't feel the need to sit down and have the hearings that I think the AG probably wanted, we, we sat down in, in good faith with the state and said, all right, wh what are your concerns? Let's talk through this. And, and, and honestly, from a company perspective, let's come to an agreement of what is decommissioning going to look like for Massachusetts. We're not the first plant in Massachusetts to have decommissioned. Yankee Row has been decommissioned since uh, I think the early 2000s. So it's not unique in what the state kind of expected to see in a nuclear um, uh, decommissioning. So that's what we did is we sat down. Uh, and, and lay out, laid out some financial um, protections, some environmental protections, um, and you know some funding sources for some of the agencies that will be tied into decommissioning so that there's continued uh, funding available for them as we go through the process. All right, All right good. So I appreciate the explanation on that. So, so the decommissioning basically is what you said, is that it's really shutting down the plant. Yeah. So if you could talk about a little bit about the, uh, the process of how that happens and what is the, uh, what's the current pro progress sure. of the plant. Sure. So I think the easiest thing is, you know, as you mentioned, we shut down in May of 2019, 47 years of uh, continuous operation. Within that first week, you took away um, uh, the fuel out of the, uh, uh, the reactor itself, put it all in the spent fuel pool, and then you, you said, all right, I'm permanently defueled. Um, and the reason for that is to cool that. Yes, yeah. exactly. Yeah. So, and then at that point, you send a letter into the NRC, say we'll never put fuel back in this reactor. That effectively kills the license for the reactor. Um, basically, the, the last two years we've spent, um, you know, you've draining systems you don't need anymore for, you know, it was when it was operational, you would need them, you don't need them in decommissioning. Um, but really started loading that fuel that had been in the <coughs> pool, some of it, you know, since uh, 1972. Uh, into these dry casts, and we're going to finish up that project actually next week. We'll have all the spent fuel pool out of the uh, pool and in, up to the, it's called the Independent Spent Fuel Storage Installation, it's FISI pad. Um, we love acronyms in nuclear. Mm -hmm. um, so we'll have that uh, all accomplished next week, which is a huge milestone for the station. Because so really, all of it fuel will be yeah. up. Yeah. So um, really, with is that, that ahead of schedule, too? It, it, our I thought I remember yeah. it was going to be like five years at one point. So there's been tech. technology changes. Some of the stuff okay. Holtec uh, has been able to do. Um, Back in the day, it would have had five years, kind of minimum. Mm -hmm. um, two, two and a half now is some of the okay. some of the timelines. Um, there are some places that have put fuel into canisters after a year, mm -hmm. but it's a mix of fuel. Mm -hmm. So 
you know, it really comes based on heat load. But our initial, even our initial schedule was we had envisioned probably early in 2022, March, April, May, somewhere in that time frame uh, when we talked about it. So we are a little bit ahead of schedule. We've, we are a fleet, so we have the Oyster Creek plant that I talked about. They successfully offloaded all their fuel back in July. So we took a lot of lessons learned from what they were able to do uh, to allow us to kind of follow the same path with them and okay. be successful. Okay. So, so Pine, what, is, uh, what are some of the, the challenges or what are some of the things the, that your committee or panel is actually working on then with Holtec? And what are some of the challenges? Well, the first challenge is to become a nuclear engineer in a couple of years. <laughs> So that you, you know what I do? So I just listen to Mary under. Lambert. I learned from Mary Lambert well, how this all works. That's how she, I get my lessons. Uh, <laughs> I would say she's been she's been working on it since I think '86 when yeah. she first mm -hmm. uh, uh, joined mm -hmm. the uh, the Plymouth County Collective, as we mm -hmm. say. Mm -hmm. um, but and 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 there's a lot of appreciation to the mm -hmm. depth of their understanding Absolutely. and and the amount of work that she and her husband both put into mm -hmm. it. And I think Jim comes to it because his father was a a nuclear engineer. So there's a lot, mm -hmm. there's a lot of knowledge base uh, within their their uh, pursuit of uh, of um, a clean and safe environment. Mm -hmm. I would say I think that's basically their their driving force. Um, and is that the driving force of the panel as well? I think the driving force for the panel is to um, have the the facility, which is 100, 100 or 200 acres of the site. Yeah, 148 acres. Um, Cleaned up and 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 dismantled. So decommissioning involves Dismantle taking the, the buildings, taking yeah. the reactor apart and all that sort of stuff. That you know, there's there's language here that we're mm -hmm. learning. So definitions. Decommissioning has to do with the nuclear part aspects of it. Uh, cleanup is basically all the rest of the stuff that's on site, the garages and the offices and all that sort of stuff. And I think Holtec's um, idea is to is to um, clean up the site as well. Mm -hmm. um, our my perspective as as a director of the Watershed Association has always been, hey, sea levels rise and folks, you don't want to leave that place dirty. Let's get it clean as clean as possible so that the environment of Cape Cod Bay is safe and the environment in Plymouth is safe. And so the the panel is has is a mix of, of public members and state agencies that come at it from different perspectives and hopefully the collective perspective will accomplish that goal and that we will have a safe, you know, 149 or 50 acres as well as the remaining, um, you know, Pine, Bar Pine, uh, Pine Hills area um, in Plymouth that can be then either protected or developed in a way that, that well, the both. community yeah. can appreciate. Yeah, yeah. So you, you brought up Cape Cod Bay. Recently there was an article, I believe it was the Cape Cod Times, uh, that talked about the, the uh, discharge from the plant into the Cape Cod Bay uh, and concerns about that. Can you talk about that a little bit? Sure. Um, the, you know, the, one of the objections to the operating reactor was that it sucked in almost 500 million gallons of water every day, passed it through the reactor to keep it nice and cool, and discharged it. And with that discharge, there were always some contaminants. Um, the, the former companies were required to monitor that discharge. They could they could reach a certain level of contamination, but not more than that because of the environment and the importance of Cape Cod Bay, which I, my perspective is it's the nursery for the Gulf of Maine. You know, it's the reason the Pilgrims came. You know, it was the fishery. It wasn't it wasn't anything other than that really. Um, it was a, a, it was a life sustaining environment. Um, we don't want to see Cape Cod Bay contamin contaminated any further. There was some injury to Cape Cod Bay in terms of all the heat discharge. We don't have that anymore. Uh, there's been a new, what they call, um, non-point source pollution discharge elimination systems permit uh, that is uh, uh, given by EPA. It was just updated in January of 2020, I believe, um, to cover this decommissioning process. That permit doesn't allow for instance, the spent fuel pool to be discharged into the bay. Yeah. But because EPA doesn't govern radioactivity, there's some sort of wishy-washy um, room about whether uh, the NRC would allow it, whether the NRC could overrule 
the That's a EPA. nuclear regulatory commission. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, and, and so that, you know, we're having that discussion now, I would say, in terms of, okay, what's going to happen with the water that's in the pool that cooled all that heavily radioactive mm -hmm. material? And people have to realize, you know, those spent fuel rods are still 90% effective, right? Mm -hmm. There's 90% of the energy that was originally there is still there, mm -hmm. you know, in some cases, not, not, not evenly, but, you know, mostly. And, and so that's, the, that's why it's radioactive. That's mm -hmm. why um, it's, it's, a, it's a problem for us. That's why it's disappointing that the federal government, the Department of Energy, hasn't provided an off-site yeah. reasonable yeah. storage system that's, that's, um, that everyone can appreciate. Mm -hmm. There's certainly a lot of contest with that. We think that it might be on the Hill for a really long time, yeah, yeah. and that's a matter of concern. That's not necessarily the jurisdiction of the panel, but in my view, my personal layperson's Cape Cod Bay interest view, uh, we can't go to rest until that's dealt with. Yeah. Do you, do you, would you say that's like the number one issue that you're, you're um, really No, I think number one about? is decommissioning. I okay. think number one is taking the reactor apart and getting okay. all of that stuff, getting the fluid contaminants under control so there's no more accidents that can happen. Okay. Uh, I think Holtec is doing a good job on that. Okay. I, I, I'm, as I said publicly before, I'm glad they're there. They know way more than I do about this. Mm -hmm. um, and they've got the, um, the capability, certainly, of addressing that. The question is, can we all be really careful and not mm -hmm. go to sleep on the job and make sure that we're really paying attention to all of yeah. the details? Because the details in this kind of business can cause real can problems. Can cause problems, yeah. So with that being said, Patrick, what's the, what's the completion, what's the completion going to look like and what's the sure. timeline on that? So when we when we came in in 2019, we said and it's a, it's an eight-year projected project. So you're talking 2027. So we're a couple years into that project right now. Um, and as we work through it, it's really um, you know as, as Pine was saying, we're identifying you know through r historical record, but also through sampling, testing groundwater, um, you know soil, what's there, what needs to be cleaned up. And as we do that, we're, we're, and the easiest thing I've, I've used at the NDCAP a lot. Picture the reactor as a bullseye and we're working our way in. So you, you look at what was impacted by the site's operations, we work our way in uh, over the course of, of time. So uh, it's an iterative process, but by the end, really the goal is to have um, a site that's cleaned up to the, stand, the Massachusetts standard, which is 10 mil RM. Um, so that would be someone who, uh, and I think that's the resident farmer standard, it would be right. someone who lived there, farmed there, 365, uh, they could get no more than 10 mil RM. Uh, for an entire exposure for the year. So it's a pretty low standard. The NRC's limits is actually uh, 25 millirem per year. So NASA is a very conservative. Uh, I remember that uh, was one of the biggest yeah, things abso that, absolutely. that the Attorney General really Yeah, and absolutely. And that was one of the yeah. first things we agreed to. You know, yeah. we, un we understood where the state was on that. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that's what we're looking at. Really, our goal is to get it clean so that, in, in my opinion, uh, you, know, you know me being a Plymouth resident, what's the next thing for that property. How, I was just going to ask How can that. it be so, an economic yeah, yeah, engine in the yeah. future? So So you're saying that that could be actually built upon then yeah. and there's with really no restrictions whatsoever. Uh, depending on where there there could be restrictions in um, certain parts yeah, of that certain, certain areas and obviously acres or something. Yeah, obviously you're going to have the the spent nuclear fuel pad still mm -hmm. for a while. So that's going to take up some of that that room and um, but yeah, th there's going to be a way to do what we'd call a partial site release that would allow okay. for uh, conditions, you know, to basically be reused in, in certain manners. Um, so that's what we're looking at. You know, Holtec, we want to get it cleaned up, and then you know we've committed to the town. We'll have discussions with them. Um, the closer we get to that, uh, about you know what's the vision. You know, I know the town has asked for all the property for nothing, and you know, understanding that this is an asset for a company. Um, but what we've committed is we will work with them because you know wh whatever it is, we want it to be done right. We don't want to impact that uh, you know the town in a negative fashion, uh, and obviously we want it to be a success. How many acres do you think can be utilized for the town or a developer? Yeah, you know, that, that, that's a, that's maybe a good half of it's it. It's a maybe? good question. I don't or even is it know. Hard to tell at this point. It'd be hard to tell because there yeah. is, and Pine would know this too. There's natural habitat that's mm -hmm. critical in there. Mm -hmm. uh, there are some uplands that I think have water. You know, so it's it, 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 it's a granite ledge in some places yeah. too. Yeah. So uh, it'd really be uh, something that would have yeah. to be evaluated. And not that you want to develop all. of it. No, 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 no. no. Find the right mix. I mean, you yeah. ha you yeah. have a you have a, a, a 140 acres right on the water that have been disturbed previously. Previously, um, you have some acreage across the street that's been that disturbed when the plant was being uh, built, mm -hmm. but then you have some virgin land, and there's there's a lot there, and it you know it runs all the way up to the Pine Hills development itself. Yeah. So it's a pretty big swath of land on the east coast. So, so is there a time frame that you you guys are looking at? Um, 
I, as I said to the town, I think the, you know the closer to th probably three years out from completion is where we'd start to talk to, uh, you know, what would be the next use and how can we look at it. You gotta understand, Holtex a company too that we manufacture 100% American, so we have all of our manufacturing we ship around the world. Um, we everything we have is in the U.S. We have plant in Camden, New Jersey that previously was. Uh, an old shipbuilding um, facility that had been uh, abandoned since the 60s. It was a super fun site. We cleaned that up and then put a, a state-of-the-art facility there. Uh, we cleaned up an old Westinghouse site in Pennsylvania, did something there. So there's always that opportunity, too, where we might be the ones that want to develop something that could bring in you mm -hmm. know, economic opportunities in the community, or we would look to, to partner with someone to do something similar. Mm -hmm. But do you think that in maybe in two or three years that you'll be done with the cleanup and the decommissioning? The cleanup's 20, 2027 would really be the, okay. the, the partial site release okay. uh, at that point. And then um, from then on out, it, you'd have the fuel up on the hill, and, mm -hmm. and you really need to figure yeah. out what you're going to yeah. do with the rest of that property. So with, with the fuel being so up on the hill after that time frame, what do you think? Is there still a role for NDCAP to be involved, or how do you foresee that maybe happening, Pine, over, over the time? Um, uh, as you said, because it can't be moved to off-site to another location yet, so... So, you know, it, that, that's, a, an, that's a really complicated question mm -hmm. because it's not in our hands. It's mm -hmm. not in Pat's hands, mm -hmm. not my hands. It's really in the federal government hands in terms of the Department of Energy. Mm -hmm. That creates a big problem. Yeah. Um, even though they're going to and have, have announced another, you know, um, consent-based siting discussion, um, it's, it's difficult to imagine 90 or 100 nuclear reactors that have at least as much fuel as we do on site, um, all in one spot. And so I think that there's going to be a lot of uh, activity intellectually and, and in groups like ours. Um, I'm trying to get that discussion going within ENDICAP because I think that within the New England region we have the capacity to to try and figure out if there's another way of doing it rather than relying on the government that can't that that changes that changes uh, coaches every couple yeah. of years yeah, exactly. and then changes yeah. the whole ball game um, with something like uh, nuclear fuel that that is very dangerous for ten thousand years and still not addressed for almost a million years you know it, it, it's hard to it's hard to fathom what what the real um, answer is. Um, but I think that we owe it to ourselves and our grandkids, frankly, mm -hmm. uh, to figure it out. And, and I'm, I'm willing to try and push the point. Yeah, good, good. Um, how can the, I'll ask both of you this question, um, how can the general public stay informed about, you know, what, what are the updates and I know they can go to the meetings, they can watch the meetings, but so, how, is there other ways that they can Well, we informed? have, you know, through the, the um, Secretary of Energy and Environmental Affairs, the ENDICAP has a website on the state okay. website. So go to massgov.gov, uh, Google ENDICAP or Nuclear Decommissioning Citizen Advisory. That'll take you to our site where all the minutes of the mm -hmm. meetings are, all the presentations Patrick has made, um, you know, different, uh, different documents from the NRC, for instance, or, or DOE are posted there that, that we feel might be helpful. Um, they can reach out to us through that. We're still a little slow in terms of getting our, our emails uh, working that way, but we will do that so that it, you can contact us directly. Uh, we're all people in the, mm -hmm. in the area, and, and you know, we might miss the email, but you know, you know, free to send it mm -hmm. again, of course, mm -hmm. um, or give a call. Um, mm -hmm. We're not that hard to find, mm -hmm. I don't think, no. although, although we'll, um, we'll post something on the website in terms of making it easier to yeah, okay, good, be in good. touch with us. And, um, I was from just saying, your yeah, Holtec Holt yeah, Holt has a very uh, dynamic website uh, that has the decommissioning plants that we have that have frequently asked questions. Uh, so there's a lot of information on there, a lot of videos. That we, I did a video with the last fuel campaign of start to finish, how we load a cask and bring it down and bring it out uh, for storage. So there's that type of thing. Our social media channels, Twitter and Facebook, uh, have a lot of information as well. And then obviously, you know, directly emailing, same thing with Pine. I get a lot of uh, emails from concerned citizens and, and, and work to, to help there and, and answer any questions mm -hmm. that may be mm -hmm. uh, out there. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, there really hasn't been a, I don't think, a really economic impact to the 
plant closing. Would you would you kind of agree with that somewhat? Uh, I wouldn't. Well, you think there was? You think yeah. maybe there was? Or I maybe mean, not I, as I think big as there was. I think there's an impact to Plymouth. Yeah. yeah. You know, there's there's a tax loss, uh, base loss there. Mm. You know that that the the town is going to struggle to fill. Mm -hmm. um, but. No, I, I definitely not as great as it was. I think like no, 10 I, years no. Ago. I was going to say yeah. the the, the town right, is, the so. town did a good job ahead of time preparing for it, um, even before I think it was announced. Uh, I think select my former select my Mahoney, yeah. who's the chair of yeah. their handicap, actually put a fund together yep. as a select board Absolutely. member to have money put in there Absolutely. to kind of help with this thing. Yeah, and to prepare for it. And I think too, yeah. you know, thinking back to when Boston Edison sold it to, or yeah, Boston Edison sold it to Entergy. Um, you know, at one point the plan had been paying about twenty million dollars in taxes. That's back when we had a hundred million dollar budget. I think at the at the town level, we're for last year we paid six and a half million dollars on a two hundred and forty million dollar budget. So there's, it, it's much less of an impact mm. um, as things start to wind down. Um, but I think you know between that and then honestly, you've lost. You know, we had six hundred employees when we shut down. Uh, we're down to about uh, hundred and forty now, and we'll go down in January to. Something in the low 40s, 50s, somewhere in that range. Majority uh -huh. of that security. So you've lost a lot of people. Yeah. Some have stayed in the area, and, and we've worked really hard to get people that wanted to stay in the area jobs again. Mm. Um, working with the Chamber of Commerce on that just recently on, on one of our job fairs. But I think you know, not having the the refueling outages every two years that used to bring in an extra 600 empo uh, employees that really would bring money in on the shoulder seasons. That's a good point, so I mean, yeah. there's a lot of that, yeah, and yeah. I think just a lot of goods that you know we used to use mm. when we were an operating plant that we don't really you know have anymore. So. Yeah, 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 yeah. So if anybody wants to become a member of the panel, how should they go about doing that? Should they reach out to to the panel? To me, or both of us, or I would love it. I would say you. I would love it if they would yeah. reach out. They to can you. reach you out because, to me because, because most of those seats have specific appointing authority. Okay, so, that's really, so yeah. my for those you don't know, my email address Matthew with one T dot Muratore M U R A T R E at M A dot gov. Thank so you. So reach out to me if you're interested in joining the panel. I want to thank you, Pine, Thanks and thank much, you, man. Patrick, Absolutely. very much for coming on and particularly you for, I mean, you don't get paid to do this, but the time and effort that you and your commissioners are putting into this, so we really appreciate thank that. You. And good luck with the report you're going to be sending to the governor pretty yeah, soon, thanks, too. Thanks for that. Yeah. <laughs> and I want to thank all of you at home for walk, watching. We hope you enjoyed today's program, and I hope you found it informative as well. And again, I want to thank uh, Julie and the, the guys in the booth and the whole staff here at PAC TV for another great show and for all of what they do in the community. And thank you at home for watching. We'll see you next time on State Matters.